right, please open paragraph twenty-two for me. Again, first we need to identify what is a contingent liability, initial recognition and measurement, and subsequent recognition and measurement. Right now, when we look at a contingent liability, this will be in terms of IS thirty-seven. Provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets defines a contingent liability as a possible obligation that arises from a past event, and thus existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events, not wholly within the control of the entity, or. A present obligation that arises from past events, but not look at this, but not recognised because it is not probable that an outflow of resources embodying economic benefits will be required to settle the obligation, or the amount of the obligation cannot be measured with sufficient reliability. Remember your recognition criteria. Therefore, if you look at this in terms of IFRS three, again we only have to meet the definition of this liability, and then we recognise a contingent liability. Therefore, it's a possible obligation. Now, if we take this one step back, when our parent purchased there. Investment in the subsidiary, wholly owned. Remember, we debit our investment in the subsidiary. We consolidate. We add all of the assets plus all of the liabilities into our group. Now, if we identify at acquisition date that there is a contingent liability of which our subsidiary did not recognise because. It did not meet the recognition criteria. Remember, for our subsidiary to recognise this liability, it has to meet the definition of our conceptual framework plus the recognition criteria. Then only may the subsidiary recognise the liability. But for group purposes, we may recognise credit this contingent liability. For group purposes, into our group, even if it only meets the definition of a conceptual framework. Then, important measurement should be at fair value at initial recognition, right? But what about subsequent measurement? Now that we look at this, if you look at our notes on the left side. This is paragraph fifty-six, which you can open, please. We will recognise at the higher of the amount that would have been recognised in terms of I S thirty-seven versus the initial amount recognised. Therefore, at the higher, you will have to identify what is the amount as per I S thirty-seven versus what is the amount recognised at fair value on initial recognition. Then exception number three, indemnification asset. What is again? We need to identify what is an indemnification asset, initial and subsequent. What is an indemnification asset? Where the seller contractually indemnify the acquirer for the outcome of related to all or part of a specific asset or liability. Normally, when you read through a scenario, you will be able to identify that our contingent considerations and our indemnification assets appear to be together. Certain scenarios do include this, because normally it indicates that there will be an additional payment when something happens. Or now, an indemnification asset. Let's say, for example, we take this out. Indemnification asset stands on its own. Our subsidiary indicate to our parent that they know about a certain lawsuit against 
the subsidiary. Therefore, our previous shareholders indicate in the contract that should that lawsuit be finalized and the group have to pay out a certain amount, that the previous shareholders will indemnify, they will pay to the parent a certain amount to recover those losses. Therefore, we may recognize this separately and we will debit an indemnification asset in the separate records. Now, when you look at this, let's just quickly recap. An intangible asset, if it meets the identifiability criteria, we will recognize this separately from goodwill. A contingent liability, we may recognize separately from goodwill and the indemnification asset we may recognize separately from goodwill. Therefore, debit or credit that specific line item. And if we take this one step further, on initial recognition, we should recognize this at fair value. Right, let's move on. Initial measurement at fair value, all the identifiable assets and liabilities. This is another rule. Now you will remember that we have already indicated that we have our parent purchased wholly owned subsidiary and this will now be a group. At acquisition date, we consolidate add assets plus liabilities of parent and subsidiary into one. Now let's say for example, our subsidiary had a building included in its annual financial statements to the value of 100,000. But at acquisition date, this building had a fair value of 120,000. Therefore, there will be a fair value adjustment of 20,000. For group purposes, we need to include this building at fair value into our group. Therefore, on initial recognition, our journal entry will be to debit the investment in our subsidiary and to debit that adjustment building increase with a value of 20,000. Therefore, this 20,000 will increase the net asset value of the subsidiary. Now, let's just take this one step further. Our next step, our NCI. Now, remember, the NCI can either be measured, one, at proportionate share of our assets of the subsidiary or based on the fair value. Now, if at fair value, you need to remember the NCI will share in the goodwill. A portion of the goodwill should be allocated to the NCI. Next step, goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. Now, let's just take this one step back again our parent purchase shares in a subsidiary now let's say for example the net asset value of the subsidiary is eighty thousand but the parent paid a total amount of a hundred thousand therefore the parent included in that hundred thousand a possibility of purchasing goodwill of this company Therefore, if your consideration exceeds the net asset value, therefore, if your payment is greater than the net asset value, there will be goodwill. If it is smaller, this will be a gain on bargain purchase. If there's a theory question, you always have to indicate that you will have to reassess all the items. And if it is still a gain, you will recognize this at acquisition date in profit or loss. Right. Now, let's just quickly recap the principles here. You will have to obtain the consideration transferred. Remember that this is the amount that the parent paid at fair value plus any NCI, which can either be based on proportionate share or based on fair value. Then, if there is any previously held interest, which we will only cover 
when we look at changing control. You will have to add this minus your net assets acquired. And remember, measurements in terms of RFRS 3. Now, what does this mean? Remember, if you look at your net asset value of the subsidiary, there might be additional intangible assets in terms of our RFRS 3 rules. There might be a contingent liability in terms of RFRS 3. There might be an indemnification asset in terms of RFRS 3. And this will be a total net asset value for group purposes that we need to take into account, which we will then compare with our consideration transferred plus our NCI plus any previous held shares. The total of this we will have to compare to the net asset value of the subsidiary in terms of RFRS 3. Now, let's have a look at measurement period. Now, I want you to please spend a bit of time, open these paragraphs, work through them. I'm just going to cover the basic principles. Now, if we look at measurement period, look at my timeline at the bottom. Let's say, for example, at acquisition date is 1 April 2020. Remember, on this date, the consideration should be at fair value and all of the identifiable assets and liabilities should be included at fair value. This is the rule. Now, it might be that on this date that the accounting is incomplete. Information is incomplete in terms of our at acquisition date transaction and we need to use the information as is. Right. Now, Within one year, we need to include the adjustments in terms of our final amounts. We only have one year from acquisition date. Once, let me just indicate to you acquisition date, this will now be from 1 April 2020 until 1 April 2021. Once we obtain the final fair values, the final amount, we need to correct this retrospectively going back. If there is an error that becomes available after measurement period, therefore if we identify that there is an error in an amount after measurement period, we will have to apply our IS8 principles. And then you can briefly work through the disclosure requirements for me as well. And this is our important principles in terms of RFRS 3.